All right, folks, welcome back. So today we're going to take a look at, or start taking a look at, the actual Roman Empire. And we're going to do that first by looking at Augustus, who is the first emperor of Rome. And then this week we're going to zero in on several other emperors, good, bad, crazy, um, and you're going to create a report card for one of them. So that's sort of what's on the docket this week. First, what I wanted you to think about were your kind of thoughts on Julius Caesar. You were supposed to have looked at some historical facts and then watched that Ancients Behaving Badly episode, which is very biased against Julius Caesar, focuses a lot on his sexual exploits, which um, may or may not contribute to him being a good or bad leader. But ultimately, the question you were supposed to be thinking about was, is Caesar Ju Julius Caesar a hero for ending the Roman Republic or a tyrant for ending the Roman Republic? I find that usually classes are fairly split on that. So whether you think hero or tyrant, you are totally within uh, probably valid opinion. A lot of the things that people point out about Julius Caesar in terms of the tyrant side are the ways that he rises to power, the motivation behind him doing things, uh, as well as people tend to point out the campaign against Gaul and how awful he is to, you know, the women and children there, uh, cutting off hands and all of that sort of thing. Um, in terms of the good, they do focus on the fact that people in Rome loved Julius Caesar, certainly not the Senate, hence stabbing him 23 times, um, but the plebeians loved Julius Caesar, and part of that was because he put on really great uh, public games, and he really did try to advocate for the rights of the sort of every man, the commoner. Unfortunately, of course, because of his death, we don't get to see what he would have been like as an emperor, um, but maybe you'll may see some connections between him and Augustus. So again, with Julius Caesar, whether you think good or bad, totally, totally a valid opinion, I'm sure. I do want you to think about the criteria of what makes a good emperor. Before you look at the rest of the emperors that you're going to examine, I do want you to come up with some success criteria, and that will be on um, a note that you'll be doing after this slideshow. A lot of times people pick out things like popularity with the people, legacy, uh, economic prosperity, peace, military expansion. So you can really focus kind of on whatever you think might make a good emperor. And certainly your opinion on what make, might make a good one could differ from someone else's. But I do want you to think about that criteria. Have it in your mind as we're discussing Augustus. So Augustus is the first emperor of Rome. Our question for him was, is, was he a successful leader? And I think the answer to that will be fairly clear. Uh, won't be quite as clear as for some of the emperors to come, though. In terms of Augustus's rise to power, and we'll kind of just go over this quickly, he essentially is born Octavian, so his, his real name is not Augustus. That's a name that's given to him. He is then adopted by Julius Caesar, who is his great uncle, uh, because Caesar's one son gets, gets killed son with Cleopatra. But Octavian, as sort of the adopted heir to Caesar's throne that he never really gets to claim, uh, he decides that along with Antony and Lepidus, they're going to create a second triumvirate. So hopefully you watched that video on Julius Caesar and saw that he creates a first triumvirate with Pompey and Crassus and really tries to, again, break up the Roman Republic, but very soon after those three turn on each other. Same thing happens here. You've got Antony, Lepidus, Octavian. They divide the provinces amongst themselves without talking to the Senate. And then about 10 years later, the triumvirate ends. Essentially, Antony is accused of challenging Rome by having relationships with, e with Egypt, specifically with Cleopatra, who he was said to have been in love with. Um, Augustus fights Antony at the final battle of Actium and wins. And then Antony later kills himself, and then Cleopatra kills herself. Uh, usually the love story between Antony and Cleopatra is a little bit more realistic or believable than that between uh, Cleopatra and Caesar, which does seem a little bit more political in nature, both on the hand of Caesar as well as on the part of Cleopatra. Because she, if you think back to ancient Egypt, she was really trying as the last Egyptian pharaoh to 
maintain some hold over Egypt. So she is also being very politically strategic. We can't give her no credit there for her role in this entire thing. Essentially, though, what you've got during this time is kind of a civil war, just like we saw again before Julius Caesar's uh, claim to dictatorship. You've got a civil war, which essentially ends when Octavian, soon to be Augustus, assumes power, and he's kind of universally supported in that. In 27 BCE, that is the founding year of the empire. If you remember, the founding year of the Republic is 509 BCE. So, you know, almost 500 years later, you've got the founding of the empire. And the Senate is the one that gives Octavian the name Augustus, or the revered one for life. And that's the title that he's always called afterwards. He receives a few different titles. Imperator, which is usually a title given to very successful generals. Uh... He is never given the title of emperor in his lifetime, so that's a, a key fact to kind of think about. He, just like Julius Caesar, did not want to make claim to emperorship or kingship because he knew that the people of Rome were against that. People of Rome weren't stupid enough to think that they weren't being ruled by one man, but that idea of calling him an emperor and, or calling him a king, at least at this time, is still something that is too reminiscent of the Etruscans and the bad stuff that went along with those Tarquin kings, so they want to avoid that. Augustus also gets the name Princeps, or first citizen, so making him the kind of the first citizen, the most important one within Rome. So let's take a look at the reasons that some people consider him to be the greatest Roman emperor, uh, and then we can chat a little bit about whether or not you agree with that or not. Hopefully you're following along with your note, and you can add some details in as we chat about things. Two of the biggest issues that people usually highlight with Augustus are that he brings 40 years of peace to Italy, so to that kind of Italian peninsula, which is not called Italy yet, but that's the area that we're looking at. And you've got a huge increase in prosperity. We're going to take a look at how those things manage to happen. In terms of military expansion, if that's something you want to think about, this here in the purple is Rome under Julius Caesar. Over here you can see circled very beautifully in the mint green. Um, are the additions by Augustus. So when you look at them side by side, you don't have a ton of expansion going on. It's not like you have, you know, um, the creation of a massive empire like with Alexander the Great. Certainly, expansion is not a focus of Augustus. That's not one of the main things he was trying to do. You do have slightly enlarged frontiers. Moreover, though, what Augustus really does is he stabilizes and properly defends those areas. So he builds new towns in the Roman design in areas that didn't have administrative structures before. So he tries to create some stability in those areas that were lacking to really, again, bring stability to the Roman Empire and uh, create a strong foundation. He does extend the empire beyond the Alps. He pushes into the Elbe, annexes several regions... Uh, he does change the army so that recruits sign on for 16 years and then it becomes 20 years and really does create it as a professional career. So there are military things that he does and that he is successful in, but this is just not a major focus of Augustus. Unlike Alexander the Great, it's not just about him wanting to push forward and create the largest empire. It does seem to be more about Augustus wanting to create a stable empire. Not that he wants to shrink boundaries, but that he wants to make sure that the boundaries that he has are very stable before expanding them. In terms of Roman infrastructure, he actually does a lot of things there as well. He improves the infrastructure in Rome. One of the major things he does is he improves roads. And in that previous shot, you can see this is a road in Pompeii, if you've ever been to Pompeii uh, and seen the remains there. He really does go on this kind of campaign to, to restructure the roads in Rome and make communication much easier. Also make the movement of troops within the empire much easier. Some other things he does are create an official courier system, an official police and firefighting service within Rome. So previous to this, it would have been, you know, military would have been in charge of police matter matters. It would have been a volunteer fight firefighting force. So he creates these as official positions, again, strengthening and stabilizing the administrative structures. He also reorganizes the provincial systems of Rome, so stabilizing tax collection and administration across the empire. Another thing he's 
that he does is ensures that the aqueducts don't fall into disrepair. The aqueducts seen here, and you can still see them throughout the, the kind of ancient Roman Empire, certainly in with throughout Italy, but also you can see them in other areas. He wants to make sure that these aqueducts which carry water into Rome don't fall into disrepair. And so you can see kind of how the aqueducts work. You'll have a little bit more of a chance to look at aqueducts later on. But he does make sure that those uh, are well structured and stabilized so that you can bring water, clean water, into the city. Another thing he does is he really focuses on the arts, and this is called the Augustan Age of Cultural Excellence. One of the most important things that he does um, is artistic patronage. So he really does encourage artists and writers to, to let their artistic sides flourish. He is the one who actually commissions Virgil to write the Aeneid because he thinks we Romans need a heroic ancestry like the Greeks had with Homer and his Iliad and Odyssey. We need those heroes to look back to. And so the Aeneid, if you remember, was that story of Aeneas, the Trojan War hero, traveling from Troy, you know, making his way all the way around to Latium on the Italian peninsula and essentially setting up... Uh, Latium, which then his founders uh, then set up Rome. So it gives that sort of uh, foundational structure. In terms of the arts, he does different things with artworks. A lot of the art that he encourages is, as example here, the Laocoon, is basically copies of Greek. Uh, sculpture. This sculpture, the Laocoon, if, if you've ever seen it in person, is actually a Roman copy of a Greek. And a lot of the sculptures we have actually that we think of as ancient Greek sculptures are actually ancient Roman copies of Greek sculpture, sculptures. So they look the same, but they were actually made by the Romans. You also have lots of mosaics. Another thing he does is he's a very enthusiastic builder. His deathbed quote was, I found a Rome of bricks, I leave you one of marble. He restores temples. He creates several buildings, obviously. Unfortunately, none of them really stand today. This is sort of the visual if you go to the Roman Forum today. Marble has totally been picked over. You have very scarce, scarce remains in terms of what is left, but you can still get a bit of a visual. And this is the mausoleum to um, Augustus. In terms of the economy, um, he is very virtuous and very moral, and we're going to take a look at immorality in the empire a little bit later on. But one of the things that Augustus really wanted to do was cut back on excess and cut back on lavish spending. So he actually gives money to the citizens. He pays money to the veterans. He spends money to purchase land for his soldiers to settle on. And if you remember, that was a big point of contention for the soldiers within Rome. He also melts silver statues to himself to attempt to appear frugal. So he definitely is economically frugal, modest. modest. Uh, he wants to cut back on excess. So, you know, the prosperity that is within Rome definitely is uh, a tribute to the things that he was trying to do at the time. Some of the keys to his ultimate legacy as the first emperor are kind of outlined here. So the Pax Romana, that Roman peace, is very important. During the time of, Aug of Augustus, you've got 40 years of peace in Rome. Unheard of, especially after all of this time of civil war and upheaval. Now you've got 40 years of peace, all under the first emperor. He really proves to the Romans that you don't need warfare in order to be prosperous, in order to be wealthy. Um, you can have a large empire and you don't need to be constantly expanding it and making it bigger in order to make money. You can be wealthy without that. He also creates a lot of paths for the future of the empire. And every emperor after him then adopts the title Caesar Augustus as kind of an official title. He is seen as a defender of Rome, upholder of justice. He does bear a lot of the brunt of responsibility to maintain the empire, but he is kind of ambitious and ruthless. Like, we can't give him no credit for the things that he does in terms of his rise to power. But when, once he gets to power, he is very effective. August is named after him. Uh, the closing of the gates of Janus is a tradition that he begins. Also, at death, he's declared a god and then worshipped by the Romans. Not something he does, but something the Senate does. So ultimately, he's a pretty good guy. 
uh, definitely you can't you can't say that he wasn't a good emperor. Uh, he definitely was great, but we need to look at what the other emperors were like. So that's next.